Um, hello, my name is Claudia Solis Lemos. I'm an assistant professor in the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery and the Department of Plant Pathology at the University of Wisconsin Madison. My background really is statistics. I did my PhD in statistics here also at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And you can learn more about me and my research in my website, which is here uh, on the bottom, and also using the QR code um, that you have here. Today, we're gonna to be talking about statistics concepts for defense attorneys. And um, the main topics that we're gonna describe are what is probability? How do we combine probabilities using the product rule and the addition rule? And how to update probabilities when new information is available, that is uh, calculating conditional probabilities and the Bayes theorem. I should highlight that all of these slides and notes can be found in this link here. <clears throat> Um, so if you have any questions at any time, you can always check the materials in there. <clears throat> okay, so when I'm talking about probability with people that are not statisticians, I usually like to start with this idea that probability is not intuitive for humans. There is something in our brains that makes it really difficult to grasp probabilities and to calculate probabilities on the spot. So usually our gut uh, will give us a probability, but that will not necessarily be the correct probability. So one of the things that I want to highlight today is that when it comes to probabilities, we want to trust the formulas rather than our gut. And I will show you some examples about how our gut tends to be wrong about probabilities. Let's say that you know that a couple has two children and you know that one of them is a girl. What is the probability that both of them are girls? I'll give you one second to think about this. You can always pause the video if you need more time. Uh, most people will reply that it is 50% because you already know that one of them is a child. The other one has a 50-50 chance of also being a girl, right? So then the probably that the both girls is probably 50%. Um, I should say that this is wrong. And we will get back to these examples later um, to, to when, when we've learned more about the probability concepts. Second example about how our gut is wrong. Um, the HIV test gives you a false positive result. That means the test is positive, but, you, but the person does not have HIV 1% of the time. This is what's called the false positive rate. If you go get an HIV test and you get a positive result, what is the probability that you're truly uh, infected with HIV? So people will think, okay, the probability of a false positive is 1%, right? So if I get a positive um, test, the probability that it is false is probably 1%. So most of the people will reply that it is 99% that you are actually sick because there's 1% chance of being falsely sick. Um, this is the answer that most people will say. Um, this is also wrong. <laughs> and then these two answers, they're built on true and real probability concepts. So there is the independence on the children's sex. There's also that the probability of one event is one minus the probability of the complement event. So those are real concepts that are actually true, but the way that we are framing the probability and the interpretations that we're getting, those are wrong. There is one very famous example where this is very obvious, and that is the Monty Hall problem. And for those that are not familiar with this, this is quite famous, but I will still say, um, it's, uh, explain it briefly. Um, we have three doors. Behind one door, there is a car and behind the other two doors are goals. And the participant will select one door randomly, and then the host of the show will open one of the doors that has a goat, and then you're given the opportunity to change doors or to stay with the door that you originally picked. Um, these appeared, uh, this, uh, the solution to this problem appeared in an 80s, 90s magazine uh, column called Ask Marlin. Uh, that was written by Marilyn Vos uh, Savant, which was a, a, a very smart uh, person. And uh, she wrote that the strategy to maximize your probability of winning is to switch doors. And people grew very angry about this. There was a survey about it where 92% of Americans think that she is wrong. Um, in fact, there are many PhDs, over a thousand of them that growled to her and demanded her that she retracted her answer because she clearly did not understand probabilities. Uh, many of these PhDs, by the way, were in math. 
And there is this even famous example that uh, the mathematician Spoiler does. Um, he refused to believe the answer even after being shown a mathematical proof. And he was adamant that that could not be the right answer. By the way, all of these um, examples, there's a source um, in the bottom if you want to check out more details. But if she was correct, so her, her solution to the problem was right, it was just not intuitive for anybody, for 92% of people responding, for over a thousand PhDs, some of them in mathematics, for famous mathematicians, nobody was, um, nobody thought it was the correct answer, even though it was. So this is another example that us as human beings, we have a hard time thinking of probabilities as intuitive. Our gut answer, our intuitive answer, I don't wanna say it's always wrong, but it's likely to be wrong um, because our brain is just not wired in a way to understand these probabilities. So the message of this first part is just to say, you are not bad at probabilities, really we all are. So when it comes to probabilities, we do not want to just trust our gut. We really want to trust the formulas. So when we're dealing with a probability, the strategy should always be to pause and say, what are the principles that are guiding this calculation? And then check them to see if, if they are okay. So we will, this is the theme of, of this lecture. We're gonna go over this multiple times. First topic, what is probability? If we go to Wikipedia, there they will say the probability is a numerical description of how likely an event is to occur. And there are many ways in which we can write down probabilities. So let's say the probability of getting struck by a lightning, we can write it as one in 500,000. You know, this is, I think this is one of the common ways uh, that uh, lawyers write probabilities. We can also write it as one over uh, 500,000. So that's the second one in here. Uh, mathematicians and uh, statisticians will prefer to write them as a number, you know, between zero and one. We divide, we put in her calculation, one divided by 500,000, we'll get a very small number, 0 0.0002. Um, this is a number between zero and one that represents the probability most widely used. If we multiply this number by 100, we'll get the percentage. And this um, is a number between zero and 100 that is also representing probability. So the same probability can be represented in these four different ways. Uh, for here, we will be using mainly, you know, one over number or the actual calculation, a number between zero and one. Because when you need to multiply probabilities, then this is, this is the easiest one to use or the best one to use. But just knowing that they all represent the same probability. Okay, in forensic science, uh, we want to answer a very specific probability, and that is what is the probability that a randomly selected individual will have a DNA profile that matches the DNA profiles from the evidence sample. Uh, why do we need, to, why do we care about this probability? Well, if this number is high, then we're not very impressed. I'm using uh, Dan Crane's wor uh, words, we're not very impressed that our subject matches uh, the evidence of the DNA profile, because it is very likely that I just grab random person in the street and there will be a match. Then if there is a match, I'm not impressed. But if this number is low, then I'm very impressed if I find a person that matches because it's very unlikely that I will just get one person randomly and, and, and match the profile. So let's start with this question in our mind. This is our goal. We want to understand how we calculate this question, uh, but let's make it easier for us right now. So let's let's change this question to something um, easier. And it's just, instead of calculating probabilities of DNA matches, let's just say that I want the probability that a randomly selected person will be a dog lover. For this example, we're gonna assume that there are only two types of people in the world, cat lovers and dog lovers. And we also want to assume that no one is both. So you're either a cat lover or you're a dog lover. And we're making all these assumptions because we want to translate these questions later to our forensic probability, where there will be two groups, people that match the profile and people that do not match the profile. So there are two groups that are not intersecting because no one can match and not match the profile. So that's why we have to assume that they're not, there's not a person that is both cat and dog lover. We need two distinct uh, non-intersecting groups, cat lovers and dog lovers. Okay. Um, Imagine for, for a while first that we have access to the whole population. So we know that 
we go out there and we ask people their preference and we know that some of them are cat lovers, some of them are dog lovers. So here I'm drawing them gray for cat lovers, um, dark pink for dog lovers. If I know the composition of the population, then answering this question is very easy because I just need to count how many people are dog lovers divided by the whole population. So if you go ahead and count, you will see that in this made of population of only 45 people, there are 21 uh, dog lovers divided by 45. So if we do the actual number in the calculator, that will be 0.467, which is 46.7%, because it's close to 50%. Uh, this is, let's just say oh, roughly one in two. This is, I, I'm using a tilde here because this is not exactly, approximately one in two. Um, so then we know. What is the probability that a randomly selected individual is a dog lover? Oh, 46%, 46.7%. That is my probability. But then the first question that you want to answer, ask here is, okay, which is this population? Because different countries could have different percentages. If I do this survey, if I ask people their preference in the US, maybe I will get this 46.7%. But if I do the same survey in Australia, I might get a different percentage, right? Because different populations have different percentage of dog lovers and cat lovers, just as we will see later on with DNA. So this question was re really not very well um, uh, specified because we want to know, I want to take a randomly selected individual from where, right? And so I will change here our question to say, to highlight the fact that we're focusing on the US population. This is very crucial because the probabilities, like I said, will depend on the population. So different populations will have different probabilities. So the probability that I'm calculating should be very um, well-defined for, for a population. And it could be as specific as I want. So I could say, what is the probability of a randomly selected individual in the US in a specific state, you know, of a specific um, income? You know, so it could be as specific as I want. In this case, we're gonna make just the whole US population as, as a population of interest. So first key message, we want probabilities. We always need to know which is the population that we're focusing on. Okay, now the second thing that we need to focus and, 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 and highlight is that in here, we assume that we know the cat and dog preference of every single person in the US, which is not realistic. So what happens in practice is that we need to focus on a sample. Yes, I'm writing here the population probability. So that is if I consider everybody, this number, we rarely know it, but I will keep it here for, for our comparison. Usually what happens is we select a subset of people and we ask their preferences just to this subset. So this is a subset of group. So I can just count. Here I have a subset of just 21 people, nine of them are dog lovers, so then I get a probability of nine divided by 21, 42.3%. If you see the sample probability is not identical to the population probability, but it's closed. It's closed because we selected a good sample, an appropriate sample. What would happen if we actually select a different sample? We could have selected another 21 individuals that are heavily biased toward dog lovers. Well, if I calculate probabilities from this sample, I will have 15 dog lovers out of 21. So my probability of a dog lover is 71.4%. This is quite different from what I know should be the true uh, population probability. So depending on which sample I select, the probability that I get could be close or far from the real probability. Let's go to the other extreme. What happens if I get a sample that is heavily biased towards cat lovers? Well, in this sample, there are only three dog lovers out of 21. So my probability is really 14.3% of having a dog lover. If this is my sample, I will say that it is very rare to find a dog lover. It's rarer than cat lover, right? So if I'm gonna use this number to say something about the whole US population, I would be wrong, yeah? Because I chose a, pro a sample that does not reflect the true proportions in the population. So we, it's very important not only to specify which is the population that I'm focusing on, 
But it's also important to know that the sample that I selected has a very big impact on the probabilities that we end up using. And also the size. It could be that I just grab six people out of the street and I ask their preferences. In this case, well, through, by luck, three of them were dog lovers, three were cat lovers, so I get a 50% probability from this sample. Okay, it's not that far from the true one, so you might say it's okay. But if you're selecting such a small group of people, you could be very unlucky and just get six cat lovers uh, in your sample, in which case you will say, oh, there are no dog lovers in the US. Everybody's a cat lover. If you are gonna make conclusions of how rare or how common something is from your sample probabilities, then you should make sure that the sample accurately reflects the proportions from the population. Otherwise, you might end up saying, oh, being a dog lover is super rare. So if I find a dog lover, if I find dog, if I find dog hair in the evidence, um, I will say, well, if someone is a dog lover, that's a high suspect, you know, because being a dog lover is very rare. But no, this was just an artifact of the sample. That was a, very, a poorly chosen sample. Um, so the key message here is the first message, we need to know which is the population that we're focusing on to calculate these probabilities. Second message is we need to know if the sample is representative of the population. And by that we mean it reflects the true proportions um, of the whole population. And recall, so this is, I, I always like to connect these to election polls because that's another example that is more, um, people are, are, are more familiar with, you know, different polls to have different results is also because they're using different samples. And many times we choose a sample, not because we want a bad sample, it's just because it's easier, right? So many times we focus on the easiest sample that we can get, getting people from cities. But maybe cities, they're heavily biased towards cat lovers, you know, because people live in apartments, there's not much room for dogs, you know, so then you end up with a sample that is not representative of your whole population. So when, when, when we want to get a sample, we do not want to try to get the easiest sample because the easiest sample, it probably will be biased. So we, we want to question what sample is why it was collected this way and whether it reflects the true population. Okay, so uh, how is it connecting to forensic? So while we really don't care, unless there's, there's dog hair maybe in, in, in the scene, uh, in the crime scene, we don't really care if people are dog lovers or cat lovers. What we really wanna ask if people have a certain allele in their DNA. And we, you will learn more about alleles. I will put some links. Um, uh, to talk more about, about the DNA profile, I put some links below in the description. Um, but we really want to focus, okay, what is the proportion of people that have an, alle an allele that I found in the DNA profile in the crime scene versus those that do not have the allele? So the number, the, the proportion of people that have this allele is what's called the allele frequency, and that will give us a sense of whether an allele is rare or, or is not rare. Okay, and again, we need a sample of the population to estimate this probability. And this is when things could get tricky because depending on this sample, you might be heavily biased to one, one race or one group um, that is not representative of, of the population. Okay, so um, again, so just, just connected it back um, to, to this main message, we, we need a sample to calculate the probabilities and we might say an allele is rarely common or extremely rare, and this just could be an artifact of the sample that I selected. Okay, now conclusions. Um, what is probability? Well, it, we, we say it's a numerical measure of how likely an event is. Uh, we estimate population probabilities from observed frequencies in sample. The questions we always want to ask is, where is the sample coming from? Is this sample representative of the population and also how large it is? So things to what we wanna ask. Now, moving on to the second topic, uh, how do we combine probabilities? And let's just imagine that you want the probability of a dog lover because you are on a dating app and you want to meet a dog lover. And let's just imagine that you're very picky and you also want to meet someone whose favorite color is red for whatever reason. 
Now, here we're interested in a combined event. We want the event of someone being a dog lover and having the red favorite color. And by the way, this notation P parentheses simply means probability of two events that we write inside. So we want the probability of someone being a dog lover and having red as their favorite color. So we are combining two events. We want the probability of both. When we want the probability of two or more events happening at the same time, we use what's called the product rule. And as its name suggests, it just means that we're gonna be multiplying the probabilities of both events. So we're gonna, to get the probability of two events happening at the same time, we multiply the probability of dog lover times the probability of someone having favorite color red. Now, we already calculated the probability of someone being a dog lover, that was the 0.467. And now we also need the probability of someone having favorite color red. I made this number up, I'm giving it to you is 0 0.09 or what that is 9%. We multiply these two numbers and we get this 0 0.042, that is 4.2%. So it's a smaller number. Why is it a smaller number? Well, because I'm adding more restrictions. It's not just a dog lover. You want a dog lover with um, red as their favorite color. So it's less likely to find someone that matches all the conditions. So as you multiply more, you decrease this probability more and more. Now let's pause for a second to, to, to ask the question, where could the 9% be coming from? How do we know if we trust it? And normally like I would pause, but you, people can also pause the video if they want to think about this. Um, the answer is this is also coming from a sample. So I grabbed, I, I, I don't think I, just check everybody in population, their favorite colors. I grab a sample of people, I ask their favorite colors and I calculated how many of them liked the red better compared to everybody. So the 9% is coming from a sample. And how do we know if we trust it? Again, is it a large sample? Is it representative of the population? Those are two questions. Okay, now uh, why do we multiply probabilities? So let's make this case simpler. I'm just changing the probabilities to both of them being 10% just for convenience. So these are just made up numbers now. Well, everything's made up numbers. But in this case, uh, I'm changing them to the probability of being a dog lover being 10%, that is one out of 10. And the probability of color red also 10%. So that means one out of 10. So if I have a hundred people, like I had here, all of them, 10, out of 100, yes, one out of 10. So 10 out of 100 will be dog lovers. Yeah. And out of these 10, one out of 10 will have a favorite color red. So when we combine both of them, dog lover and color red as favorite, we have just one guy over 100. So you are reducing the set of, of people that satisfy both conditions. Um, with, with the protocol. So that's why you're multiplying, you're making them smaller and smaller. Um, <clears throat> there is one assumption that I had not mentioned. The product rule is only valid when events are independent. So two events are independent if knowing one event does not provide any information about the other event. So just think about this. If I tell you that my favorite color is red, does that make you know whether I'm a dog lover or a cat lover? Probably not, right? Also, similarly, if I tell you I'm a, do I'm a dog lover, can you now guess my favorite color? Mm, maybe not. So these two events, knowing that one is true, does not provide any information about the other one. So we can safely say that these two events are independent, and that's why it is okay to multiply them. Let's check out one example of cases that, um, that is not, that they're not independent. And, and by the way, so this is just a summary of what I just said. Knowing that someone is a dog lover, does it make it more or less likely that their favorite color is red? <clears throat> we don't know. <clears throat> doesn't, doesn't give you any new information. Now, these are two events that are not independent. Someone being a dog lover and having a dog. If I tell you that I am a dog lover, then, it is more likely than I have a dog, right? It gives you information about 
whether or not you have a dog. Similarly, if I tell you I have a dog, then it, it is also more likely that I'm a dog lover, not a cat lover. So these two events, being a dog lover, just someone who loves dogs in general, and having an actual dog, um, they're not independent. <clears throat> so these two events, uh, we cannot use the product rule in here. We cannot multiply them because they're not. So how would we calculate this probability? We cannot use, we, are, we want to combine them. We want to have a probability of both events at the same time, but we cannot use the product rule. So <clears throat> in this case, what we would have to do is we would have to um, go get a sample and count how many people satisfy both conditions divided by everybody in the sample. So when we cannot use the product rule, our only um, approach is to go and, and get a sample again. So the product rule allows us to use information from different samples that we don't necessarily need to do at the same time to, to, to calculate probabilities together. So then as mentioned, we will need to have the whole population again and get a sample of people that are both dog lovers and have a dog. That's how we will calculate this probability when we cannot use the product rule. The product rule is this shortcut that allows us to calculate probabilities of combined events simply by multiplying probabilities. <clears throat> but as mentioned, that does not work unless the events are independent. So um, just as, as, a, as a summary, we're calculating probabilities of combined events. And this uh, product rule applies when the events are independent. Uh, how is this connected to forensic science? Well, we are, again, not interested in dog lovers and favorite colors, but we are interested in different alleles in DNA. So we might want to know what is the probability that someone has one allele in a specific locus and another allele in another locus. We want um, the person to satisfy both conditions, to have both alleles, yes? And here we're going to be using the product rule to, to multiply them. The main assumption here is that the loci or those DNA regions are independent so that we can multiply them. That is, having one allele does not make it more likely to have the second allele. Um, that's the independence assumption. Uh, I will put some links to, um, this is very important when calculating random match probabilities. And I will put some links to very good um, notes uh, from that print below. Um, now let's talk about, let's move on from product rules and uh, let's change a little bit the probabilities that we want to calculate. So imagine that you are not that picky and you would be equally happy with someone who is a dog lover or with someone whose favorite color is red. Here we're using the or statement. So again, as a reminder, these peer parentheses means probability of, and then we describe inside the events of interest. So we want someone who is a dog lover or that has a favorite color of red. <clears throat> when we have an or, so we want one event or the other to happen, not both at the same time, so one or the other, we would use uh, what's called the addition rule. <clears throat> As its name suggests, the addition rule means that we're gonna be adding those two probabilities probability of someone being a dog lover plus probability of someone being um, having red as their favorite color minus the probability that both happens at the same time. And many times we forget to subtract this probability of combined because usually the addition rule is used when there is no such possibility of both events happen at the same time. We will get to that. For this event, it could happen that someone is a dog lover and has a favorite color of red. And why do we need to subtract that? Well, when we're calculating the probability of someone being a dog lover, we count everybody regardless of their favorite color, right? So in our group of people, there are people that are dog lovers. Some of them will have yellow as a favorite color, others blue, others green, and others red. We count everybody, that we don't care about the color. So we count people that are both dog lovers and that have color red as their favorite. When we're counting now people whose favorite color is red, we count everybody in this set regardless 
of the preference of cat and dog. So when we're counting people, okay, who here has red as a favorite color? Some of them would be cat lovers, some of them would be dog lovers, yes? So we again count people that are dog lovers and have favorite color red. We have counted these people twice when we counted dog lovers and when we counted people with favorite color red. Because we counted them twice, we have to subtract them. That is the rule. Okay, now it many times we really use the addition rule when that possibility of both events at the same time is not, is not possible, <clears throat> it's not likely. Um, so here in this case, for example, you wanna calculate the probability that someone has blue eyes or green eyes. There could be perhaps someone that has one blue eye, one green eye out there, but I think we can safely rule out those as very, very small percentage, very small probability, so that people either have blue eyes or they have green eyes. In this case, we just add the two probabilities, probability of blue eyes plus probability of green eyes, and uh, we can add them without subtracting anything when both events cannot happen at the same time. So this is the addition rule. And again, how is this current connected to forensic science? Many times, especially when we have mixed samples, so we have a sample that has been contaminated or has um, DNA from different sources, it could be that there are one allele in one place and another allele, and we need someone that could match either of the alleles. So to identify a contributor of the mixed sample, you need to have one of the alleles that appeared. So in there we will do, okay, someone will have this allele or maybe they have this other allele because we've seen both of them in the sample. Uh, this or event makes us add probabilities of having one allele or another allele. And this is when we use the addition rule. So again, for mixed samples, an individual will have allele one or allele two. Uh, they cannot happen at the same time because that's, that's the same specific locus. And this is very important when calculating combined probability of inclusion. And I will put some links um, below uh, with very good um, lectures by Dan Crane. So um, another way in which the addition rule appears in, in forensic science is when uh, we have a DNA profile match that could have happened for two different reasons. So one reason is maybe it was a match by random chance, right? Or maybe it was a match by an error. And we know that there have been human error or lab errors when we are getting these DNA profile matches. Uh, we are gonna rule out the, the possibility that they both happened at the same time. It was a match by chance and by error. So I think that's very unlikely. But we can calculate this probability that there was a DNA match by a chance or by an error. And um, in one, one of them could be very small, right? So probability that there is a match by chance, you will see that later. The random match probability will be one over quintillions. It's an incredibly small number usually. But the DNA probability match due to an error perhaps is not that small. So people have estimated perhaps one in 100 uh, lab tests could be due, could have um, an error and have a, a, a match due to a lab error or a human error. This number, um, I found it off the internet. I don't even know where it came from, but there's really not, not good records of this. There's not good records of how often these lab um, errors happen. So we really cannot estimate this, this probability, but it's not one over quintillions, that's for sure right? It's, it's a lot more likely. So let's just say even if it's one in every 100 cases um, or, or lab test that there is an error, still this number overpowers the, the quintillions number. So one over quintillions plus the one over 100 is still one of 100, right? So the fact that the chance, um, the probability of random chance is so small doesn't really rule out the fact that it could be a match due to a lab error. Okay, just like a summary. So we talked about the product rule. We can calculate, we can combine probabilities of simultaneous events when the events are independent. And the addition rule, we can calculate probability of two events, either or, but when there are disjoint options, they cannot happen at the same time. The key questions we're gonna take with us forward are when multiplying probabilities, we really wanna ask, 
are this event really independent? And when adding probabilities just the same, we always want to ask, is it impossible for both events to happen at the same time? Because if it's not impossible, then we need to subtract the, the intersection. And there is one example on how we combine probabilities that is very famous. I'm sure everybody has read about this case. Uh, this is a case in the UK of someone named Sally Clark, uh, whose first child died of SIDS. So this is the uh, sudden infant death syndrome, I believe. That's, that's what it, um, the, the acronym means. Um, the first child died at 11 weeks. And then Clark's had a second child who also died of SIDS at eight weeks. And then that's when she was arrested and accused of murdering the, her, her kids because two kids in a row died of SIDS. And an expert pediatrician reported that the chance that a child will die of SID is one in um, 8,500-ish. So then the probability that one child dies of SID and second child dies of SID, we just, they use the product rule and then multiply them both. So they say, you know what? The probability that both kids died of SIDS is one in 72 millions, almost 73 millions. Um, so that's not likely. She must be guilty of murder. Um, here, again, I'm going to pause and you can pause the video. Uh, what is the problem with this probability? Well, the product rule doesn't apply because these two events are not independent. One child dying of SIDS makes it more likely for a second child to die of SIDS. And this has been um, already documented in, in pediatrics. Um, they, there could be genetic factors, environmental factors that uh, put child in um, higher propensity or higher uh, probability of dying of SIDS after parents one has died. So these two events are not independent. So therefore probability should not be multiplied. Okay, so now uh, we want to move on to this third topic and that is updating probabilities when new information is available. So let's say that again, back to our dog and lovers example, uh, you're watching photos in the dating app, and then you see a photo of someone that has a dog. And you say, okay, what is the probability that this person is a dog lover, given that they have a photo of a dog? So the important part here is given that we have new information, there's a photo of a dog right there, and we want to update our previous probability based on this new information. So we write this down uh, mathematically with this vertical bar, this represents the given that or conditioned. So again, P parentheses means probability of. So we want the probability of someone being a dog lover conditioned on the fact that they have the photo of a dog. So that vertical line means given that. So whatever we put on this side, it's a known event. This is what's called a conditional probability. The second event, so we have event of interest bar, conditioning event. The condition event is something that we know. We have certainty about this. We have seen the photo. There is no randomness anymore. We have seen it. We know it. And now we want to update the probability of someone being a dog lover, given that we have this extra information now. Okay, so conditional probability allow us to recalculate probabilities by reducing the population under, uh, that, that we're focusing on and only pay attention to those people that have dog photos. So originally we had this huge population of people. Some of them were cat lovers, some of them were dog lovers. Uh, but now we have seen that they have a photo of the dog in their app, in, the, in their dating profile. So now we're only gonna focus on those people that have photo of a dog. Some, some of them will be cat lovers, right? There's no reason why a cat lover shouldn't have a photo of a dog, but most of them, will be dog lovers. So now instead of looking at the whole population, I am only looking at the population of those that have photos of a dog. <clears throat> and now in here, we can calculate that out of the 15 people that have photo of a dog, 12 of them have are dog lovers. So our probability when, if you remember originally, we calculated as 46.7%. Knowing that someone has photo of a dog has increased the probability of being a dog lover to 80%. And that makes it right. If we see this evidence that they have photo of a dog, of course, it's more likely that this person is a dog lover. <clears throat> now, um, we have to make a distinction at this point 
between conditional probability and simultaneous probability that we saw on the product rule. So conditional probability, we want the probability of someone being a dog lover, given that or condition on them having a photo of a dog. Here, we already know that they have a photo of a dog because we have that certainty. It allows us to ignore everybody that does not have photo of a dog because we know that the person we're looking for has photo of a dog. <clears throat> Simultaneous event is different. We want the probability of someone being a dog lover and having photo of a dog. Both events are unknown. We're just blindly searching the whole space of people for someone that meets both characteristics. <clears throat> so it is a different, different population. So conditioning event, we have 12 people that have photo of a dog and uh, are dog lovers, but only focusing, dividing only on the 15 that have photo of a dog, because we already know that they have photo of a dog. On the contrast, um, in the simultaneous event, 12 people, the same 12 people, have photo of a dog and are dog lovers, same 12. But we have to divide by the whole population. But in because in this case, we don't know anything. We just want to, from the whole population, what is the probability that someone will satisfy both being a dog lover, calculate for a dog. <clears throat> so this is a different probability. Now, um, it turns out that there is an actual formula to calculating conditional probabilities instead of having to go out there and also focus on the subsets of populations is uh, we can calculate just the probability of the simultaneous event, dog lover and photo of a dog divided by the probability of the event that we already know happened, photo of a dog. So if we look at the numbers, probability of someone being a dog lover and having photo of a dog, those are the 12 people divided by everybody. That is my frequency for someone satisfying both conditions. And now how many people have photo of a dog? Well, these are this population, 15 divided from everybody. So if I make this ratio here, you get the 12 over 15 that we had already calculated from before. So this is the formula for the condition of probability. Probability of both events happening at the same time divided by the probability of the conditioning event, the one we know is true. Um, so when we want to calculate conditional probabilities, we have two options. Option one, we reduce the space to only those individuals that satisfy the condition, that is the 15 individuals that have photo of a dog, and then count how many of those satisfy the event of interest. 12 are dog lovers. That's, it gives us the 12 over 15. The other option to calculate conditional probabilities is to use the formula. So the probability of A given B is the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. A, B here being our events of interest. And this is what we did from before. You get the same number, obviously, they are the same probability. <clears throat> okay, so, so as a summary, the conditional probability, we, the second event needs to be known and thus it provides you more information when we are updating the probability of your event. Now let's pause for a second and ask this question. So what do you think happens if the events are independent? So what happens if I want to calculate the probability of someone being a dog lover, given that I already know that their favorite color is red? And again, I'm just gonna pause, but then you can pause the video if you want to think a bit more about this. Um, this is the same, it doesn't change. Why? Because knowing that someone's favorite color is red gives you absolutely no information of whether they are a dog or a cat lover. So the probability remains unchanged. So normally when we are conditioning with something, we are changing the probability of our event, changing how likely it is that they are a dog lover. But if the event that we're using to condition on is independent, it provides no information. So we remain with the exact same probability as before. We gain nothing from knowing this extra information. Okay. We're gonna do three examples now of conditional probability just to see whether we are all on the same page. And now the first example is the one that I mentioned at the beginning where I, I, I was highlighting that our gut is not a good, um, it's not good at probability. So let's say that a couple has two children 
And we want to know what is the probability that the couple has two girls, given that we know that one of them is a girl. So there are four possibilities for two children. So they are both boys, boy, girl, girl, boy, or two girls. And here we do, because we care about the order. So which one was first, which one was second. And the probabilities of all of them is the same because the probability of a boy we're saying is roughly 50%. And we multiply by the probability of the other boy, that's also 50%. I'm using the product rule here because the sex of one child does not uh, influence the, the sex of the other child. So this is 0.25. And it is the same for all the cases because boy and girl, they, they both have probability of 0.5. So we just multiply them. All of these four possibilities, they have the same probability. Okay. Now, without knowing anything else, I the probability of both children being girls is 25%, is this event right here, yeah? But um, that's not, we have extra information. We know that one of the children is a girl. So we really, we are ruling out the case of two boys. So we reduce the space to only the cases that satisfy the condition, at least one of them is a girl. That is what we know. We, need that, we know that at least one is a girl, both could be girls, but at least one of them is. Um, so in case, instead of having four cases, or equally likely, we have only three cases that satisfy the condition. So we're reducing the space of possibilities. And out of the three cases, one, one of them um, has both girls. So the probability that both are girls is one out of three, yeah? So this is the conditional probability. Now, like I told you, there are two paths of calculating conditional probabilities. One is reducing the space. So there are only three options. One of them satisfies our condition of interest, two girls. So one out of three. But we can also use the conditional probability formula, which is we want the probability that we have two girls given that at least one is a girl. This is by the formula the probability that both events happen at the same time. So two girls and at least one girl, that means just two girls, divided by the probability of at least one girl. And here we're gonna use uh, the addition rule now. So first, the probability that they're both girls is the 25%. And now the probability of at least one girl, there is at least one girl in boy girl or girl, girl boy, or girl, girl. So these are these three options that we need to add. They all have the same probability. So then if you do this in your calculator, you will get the one over three or 33% that um, we got from before. So it's the same one. So it is not the 50% that our God was telling us, it's actually close to 33%. So now let's look at the second example. It's again, the, the one that we showed for, um, our God not being good at probabilities. So I said the probability of a false positive in HIV test is one over 100. So this is um, false positive means that you do not have HIV, but you get a positive test. If you get a positive test, what is the probability that you do not have HIV? And by the way, I put a star here. These are made of numbers for all the examples that I'm gonna use, they're made of numbers. So just don't, don't, don't think that this is the right, uh, false positive rate of HIV, actually, I don't know it. Okay, our God will say that the probability of not having HIV is 1%. Why? Because the probability of a false positive is 1%. I get a positive. The probability that is false is probably 1%. That is wrong. We know that that's wrong because our God is wrong with probabilities we have to calculate a probability. And this is a very important distinction. The probability of getting a positive test, given that you're healthy, this is the one over 100. Someone that is healthy, you know it's healthy, gets a test and is positive, that is a false positive because you know the conditioning event, what you know is that this person does not have HIV. Yeah, so the true known, I mean, the, the known event is that this person is healthy and you they get a positive test. 
So probability of getting positive tests, given that you're healthy, is this one over 100. This is the false positive rate. This is different from the probability of being healthy, given that you get a positive test. In the second scenario, which is the scenario where you are, you don't know if you have HIV or not. You don't, that's why you got get a test, right? What you do know, what you have in your hand is a positive test. That is a known event. The known event is a positive test. And what I want is the probability that I'm really healthy, yes? So these two probabilities, they're different. They're not the same number. Even though our God will want them to be the same, we will always try to make these two probabilities be the same thing, they are not. So false positive is 1%. Probability of being healthy given a, pos a positive test is not uh, 1%. Confusing these two events, probability of A given B with probability of B given A is what's called the prosecutor's fallacy. And we will focus more on, on the forensic side uh, in the next slide. For now, let's just focus on, on HIV. Um, so we don't trust our gut. We have to trust the formulas. And when we have one of the probabilities and we want the inverted one, we use what's called Bayes' theorem. So Bayes' theorems allow us to switch probabilities and get the one that we want. So if we want the probability of A given B, and we only have probability of B given A, we use this formula. So we need to multiply it by probability of A divided by probability. To remind this, it's always the first one on top, second one bottom. So it's the same order, A, B, A, B. That's how I remember it but maybe it doesn't work for other people. So this is the Bayes theorem, and it allows us to invert probabilities when we have one, one of the probabilities. Note that we also need all the probabilities. We need the probability of A, and we need the probability of B. So people might think, wait a minute, I want the probability of A given B, and I need the probability of A? Yes, because if you remember, conditional probability is about updating probabilities that you already have. So you already know the probability of A, you get new information, which is B, and you want to update the probability of A given B. Okay, so let's use the Bayes theorem in our example. So we want the probability of being healthy given a positive test that's equal to probability of getting positive tests given that you're healthy, times probability of healthy divided by probability of positive test. Now, we already know this first one, that the one over 100 that was given to us, we need the other two probabilities. So what is the probability of being healthy without any information? What is the probability that you do not have HIV? Well, this probability will depend on the prevalence on your group risk. Um, so different groups will have different risk of HIV, um, and different groups have different prevalence of HIV. So the probability that you are healthy without any test will depend on the risk that you have as an individual. Let's just make up numbers for now. Let's say that my risk prevalence, um, my, my, my sick, uh, the prevalence of HIV within my group uh, is just one over 100. Therefore, the probability that I'm healthy is one minus that, so 99%. And that's the number that we're gonna use here. And this is, again, I'm going to pause because this tends to confuse people. Uh, wait a minute. To calculate probability of healthy given positive test, I need the probability of being healthy. Like I said it before, but yes, it can be confusing. But remember, we are updating a probability. So we have an original probability of how healthy you were, and now you got a positive test. And you're updating that probability with the new information. So you, yes, you do need to have a probability, it's sometimes called a prior probability of being healthy. Okay, and again, this is the answer. So because we calculate conditional, we want to update with new information. Oh, in this case, sorry, it was not, the test was positive, not negative. It was, this, this is a mistake. Um, okay, so let's just put here 99%. And now we also need the probability of a test being positive. Because if you remember when we're conditioning, we always condition on the probability of the event, how likely this event is to happen in the first place. And we rarely know this. We rarely know the probability of a test being positive just by itself. People that develop tests, they calculate two probabilities. What is the probability of a positive test for people that are healthy? And what is the probability of positive tests for people that are sick? So we know conditional probabilities only. We do not know the unconditioned probability. 
And here, the false positive, so probability of positive test given healthy, this is what's called the false positive rate. And the probability of a positive test give being six, this is what's called the uh, sensitivity of the test or the specificity. <clears throat> okay, so we, and we, we rarely know this. We tend to know only the conditional probability. So we only know uh, the probability of being a positive test given that someone is healthy. And we know the probability of positive test given that someone is sick. So we don't have um, the unconditioned probability. We only have the conditional ones. And we need to use these two conditional ones to calculate the one that we want. And we use here what's called the law of total probability. So we calculate the probability and event when all we have are the conditional probabilities. So the probability of positive test without any conditions is the probability of positive test given healthy times probability of healthy plus probability of positive test given sick times probability of sick. This is the formula for law of total probability, where you're considering both cases, multiplying by how likely it is each of the condition in the So on one side, probability of positive test being healthy, this is what we already had, the false positive rate. Probability of being healthy for me, like I said, 99%, I made this number up. It could be calculated based on someone's specific risk. The probability of someone um, positive test, uh, given that someone's sick, this is what's called the sensitivity of the test. We can assume maybe that this is 100%. Um, tests are very sensitive. If, if you're sick, you will get a positive test, yeah? Um, let's pretend for now this is a perfect test. Everybody that's sick gets a positive test. So let's say this is 100. And lastly, we need to count the, the probability of being sick. And that's you know the complement of, of that. So it's again the prevalence, the HIV prevalence in my group. If I plug in all these numbers in my calculator, I will get 0 0.0199. Then I will go back and put it here in my formula. I put numbers in and I get this 0.497 or 49.7%. Note this is not the 1% that our God was telling us. This is the probability of being healthy given that I got a positive test. So we started with a probability of 99% of being healthy, but I got a positive test. So now the probability of being healthy is lower because I have a positive test in my hand. So now it's probably kind, kind of like a coin toss, being healthy or not healthy. But it's definitely not the 1% that we had at the beginning. Let's do another example, but now with, with COVID. Um, Let's say it's a slightly different, but it's very similar in, 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 in the formulas. Let's say that you get a negative test. What is the probability that you do have COVID? Yeah, we, we all are routinely doing negative test, uh, tests. We get negative tests and we say, yeah, we go out of our lives. Well, there is a likelihood that you still have COVID even if you get a negative test. And the probability of the false negative in the COVID test is 20%. These are made up numbers, but let's just say False negative means I do have COVID, but I get a negative test. Let's just say 20% of the time that happens. The specificity of a test is, is the probability of a negative test when you're actually healthy is 99%. This is the opposite of the sensitivity. Sensitivity means you are sick and you get a positive test confirming that you're sick. Specificity means you're healthy and you get a negative test confirming that you're healthy. Yeah, so you really want a test that has good sensitivity, good specificity. Yes, detecting people that are sick, detecting people that are healthy. Yep, okay. Let's just say that I made, made this up. Let's just say that the specificity of the COVID test is 99%. So I'm gonna pause, which is the probability that we want here? So you got a negative test and you want to know whether you have COVID. Well, what I want is the probability of having COVID that is being sick, given that I have a negative test. What I have in my hand is a negative test. And I want to calculate what is the probability that I'm truly sick, given that I have this negative test. I don't have this probability. I only want to have the other one, the probability of having a negative test, given that I'm sick. This is the false negative rate that we had from before. 
I was sick, but I got a negative test. It was a false negative. This is what's the 20%. And now I need a probability for being sick without any information. So there is not much information still about uh, prevalence of different groups. Um, I mean, there is some, but let's just say for this example that um, it's just a coin toss, right? So, so let's just say it's just a coin toss. Uh, we, we go out, we try to wear masks, but you know, it's still a coin toss. So let's just say that it's just 50% chance that, I, that I'm sick. And again, the negative test, probability of negative test, we need to use the, the total lower probability. So I'm not gonna focus on this part, uh, but it's the exact same parts as we had from before. And if you evaluate this, you will get this 0.595. Uh, if you're plugging all this number, you will get a probability of being sick uh, that is smaller, yes? So you started with a 50-50 chance of being sick, but you got a negative test. So the negative test sure decrease your likelihood of being sick. And it does. So instead of being 50%, now you have roughly 17%. So it's a smaller odds. But there's still, you could still have COVID, it's just a smaller probability. But now let's say that your probability of being sick or from before, it is not 50%. Let's say that you're doing the test because you were maskless sitting next to someone who also didn't have mask in a wedding, and that person tested positive then your probability of being sick is not, a, it's not longer a coin toss, but it's much higher because you were exposed, you were at risk. So because you were exposed, then we say, well, maybe it's more likely that I have COVID. I was talking to this person for an hour, neither of us had masks and this person was positive, yeah? So then really my probability of being sick before any information should be higher, let's just say 90%. I still did the test, yeah? and I got negative test. Yeah, I get a lower probability of being sick, but it's still greater than a coin toss. This is 65%, 64.5% of still being sick. And even though I had a negative test. So this is just to say, whatever my probability of being sick from before matters just as much as having a negative test. So if you're going on on your day-to-day, -day, taking precautions, being okay, you get a negative test. Okay, maybe going back to the, the previous example, that decreases my chances of having COVID. It's very small. If you were sitting next to someone who was tested positive, you neither of you had a mask, you know, that increases your risk. So this probability is much higher. Even though you get a negative test, there's still a considerable probability that you have COVID. So I like to bring this example because. Um, the key message is the prior probability of being sick is still very important when computing the probability of sick given negative test. Or in the other words, the prior probability of an event, any event, is still probability, is still important when calculating the conditional probability of um, when, we, when we get new information to update it. Um, and we will get back to this point when we get go to forensics because it has a very strong connection to forensics. Now, I want to show two examples of other conditional probability. I call them homeworks. If people want to test more their skills and conditional probabilities, and they are, they are all on the website. These examples are in the website if people want to look, look at them. Okay, now what does this have to do to forensic conditional probability and Bayes theorem? Well, we're usually, not very interested in matches by themselves. Uh, we want to know what is the probability of someone being guilty of the crime given that they had a DNA match. And perhaps guilty is not, is not the word that, that most will use, but you'll forgive me, I'm, I'm a statistician, not a lawyer, so I'm just gonna use guilty uh, <clears throat> to make it simpler for my, for my probabilities. But let's just say this is the probability that I want. So I got a DNA match. I'm not interested in the match itself, I'm interested in probability that this person is guilty given that they got a, a DNA match. And we need to use Bayes' theorem to update this probability. And in one part, the probability that there was a, um, a match given that this person was guilty, the other probability, this is super high, yeah? If someone is guilty, they left their sample in the, in the scene and there would be a DNA match. This probability we expect it to be very high. But this other one, the prior probability of being guilty, 
needs to be based on other evidence. So even if this probability is super high, if the person was out of the country, who cares if there was a match? The probability of them being guilty is zero. They were not in the country when, when the crime happened, right? And, 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 and in some of the links below from Dan Crane's um, lectures, uh, there are some examples about this. You know, there's a match, but the person was in the other part of the country, was out of the country, you know, then this probability is zero. Yeah, the probability that they're guilty in the first place is zero. So it doesn't matter if there's a match or not. This is already um, just making the probability to, to be zero, the conditional one. So the prior probability of someone being guilty needs to be based on other evidence out there. And then the DNA match is used to update it. Yeah, so we have a prior probability this person is guilty. We get the DNA match and that's update. And lastly, um, and just, th just to remember, this is very important, just as, the probability of someone being sick uh, changed a lot, the conditional probability of being sick given a negative test. Similarly here, probability of someone being guilty will influence the probability of being guilty even after the DNA match. And to get a DNA match, we would use the law of total probability. <clears throat> so just to, just to conclude, we're, I'm just gonna illustrate some of the prosecutor's fallacies that, that are, are more common. And uh, the first one, like I said, having the probability that someone is guilty given the evidence is not the same as the probability of seeing this evidence given that someone's guilty. Usually we calculate this one, yeah? This is the one that tends to be very high, but then that does not necessarily the same as the other one. We, we, we still have to account for other <clears throat> sources of evidence. Now, another fallacy that I found is not, this was this not called prosecutor fallacy itself, but I like to include it in the same um, theme, and that is conditioning on the wrong event. So I'm gonna show you one example. <clears throat> there was a battered woman um, that was murdered, uh, battered by, by her husband, <laughs> and her husband is on trial. The defense lawyer presents the following statistics. Out of 100,000 battered women in the US, only 40 were murdered by their partner. Therefore, the probability that the husband is guilty is 40 divided by 100,000. So the question that I wanna ask is, is this the right probability? What is the probability that we really want? And we also have other statistics to help us answer this question. Of a set of 100,000 better women, 44, oh, sorry, no, 45, I cannot read. 45 were murdered and 99,955 were not murdered. So 100,000 battered women, only 44 were murdered. Out of the 40, why, why do I keep saying 44? Sorry, 45 were murdered. <laughs> Out of the 45 women that were murdered, 40 were murdered by their partner and five were murdered by someone else. So with this information, what we want to calculate is the probability that we really want for this case. So the defense attorney presented the case that the probability that someone is murdered by the partner, given that they are battered women. This is in fact 40 divided by 100,000 because we are conditioning on the set of battered women, those that are 100,000. Out of those 100,000, only 40 were murdered by their partner. So this is a correct probability but it's not the probability that we want. Yeah, so that's one of the things why we are fooled in our gut. So they give us a correct probability, but it's not the probability that we want. The probability that we want is someone murdered by their partner, given that they are murdered. We already know this woman was murdered. Yes, if you go to the street and you find someone alive who is a battered woman, you say, oh, your probability that you will be murdered by your partner is 40 over 100,000 because this woman is alive. She's part of the set of battered women alive. But if she has been murdered already, she's part of another set. This is the set of murdered women. So of the murdered women, which are 45 only now, 40 of them were murdered by their partner. So then the likelihood of being murdered by your partner, given that you were murdered, is close to 90%. So 
we are conditioning on the wrong event in this case because we have more information about this woman, not just the fact that she was more uh, battered. Okay. And by the way, people might recognize this was one of the arguments in OJ Simpson's trial. <clears throat> Um, the other fallacy was called multiple testing. And let's just say that uh, I tell you that the probability of two DNA profiles matching by chance has been calculated at one over 10,000. Um, and again, these are made of numbers. Um, a database of 20,000 men is searched and one match is found. The question is how confident do you feel with the match? And at first you might think, okay, I'm very confident <clears throat> because the probability that there's a random match is just is one over 10,000, which is very small. But you are not just grabbing one person and, and doing the test. You are testing 20,000 men, which is why this is called multiple testing. So you're doing 20,000 tests. And then the probability of finding a random match is much, much higher than one over 10,000. You will see in a second. So this is a bunch of math, but I will just go line by line. So we know that the probability that there's a match by chance is just one over 10,000. Therefore, the probability of no match is one minus that probability, you know, the opposite. Now, <clears throat> this is just for one test. So if I just test once, the probability of finding no match is this very big number, one minus one over. It's, it's very likely that I will not find a match because the probability of a match is very small. But if I do this 20,000 times, <clears throat> I need to do this probability to the power of 20,000. Why? Because these are 20,000 independent cases. So I am multiplying, here I'm using the protocol and I multiply one minus one over um, 10,000, which is um, 9,999 divided by 10,000. <clears> I need to do that 99.999% multiplied it 20,000 times. And this is the probability of having no match in 20,000 tests, yeah? And this probability, if I want the probability of at least one match, run the match, will be one minus this number because this number represents probability of no match. Probability of at least one match is one minus this number. If you will be surprised, <laughs> to know that this probability is uh, almost 90%. So it's 86% chances that you will find at least one match in 20,000 tests. So this is what's called multiple testing. Even if the probability of one match is very small, if you're searching a database with thousands of hundreds of thousands of people, the probability of finding one random chance, uh, one random match by chance um, is much, much higher. Okay, so in this case, it's 86%. So you're not surprised, not surprised at all that you find that you found one match. So lastly, uh, let's put our probability muscles to the test with one final example. So this is maybe people are already familiar with this. Um, people be calling uh, trial. There was, a, I think, robbery. Oh, yes, yeah, it's right here. <clears throat> a witness description in the robbery it was that uh, the robbery was done by a black male with beard and mustache and a Caucasian female with blonde ponytail. The defendants satisfied all these characteristics. So they have people, they, they arrested them, they have no other evidence except that they satisfied all of these characteristics. And the prosecution uh, presented the following statistics. So, and, and we don't know where these numbers are coming from, but let's just, let's just read them. So the probability that there's a black man with beard is one over 10, probability of man with mustache one over four, White woman with ponytail, one over 10. One woman with blonde hair, one over three. Yellow motor car, one over, oh, I didn't even mention the car, um, one over 10. Interracial coupling car, one over 1,000. The prosecution presented all these probabilities and said that a probability that a randomly chosen couple will satisfy all the characteristics is one over 12 million. If you were to guess, now you know they just multiplied. Yep, using the protocol. So they multiply all of these numbers and they get one over 12 million. So then say the probability that a randomly selected couple will satisfy all these conditions is one over 12 million, which is very small. Therefore, this couple must be the, the, the couple. And the jury bought these and, and they return a guilty verdict. But then what, what is wrong with this case? And again, you can pause if you, if you want a bit more time to think. 
But the first thing that we can find that is, that, that is wrong is that uh, the proto rule is not valid. These events are not independent. So beard and mustache, those are not independent events. White woman, blonde hair, ponytail, they're not independent events. Um, so we cannot just multiply them. People studying this case have actually estimated that a better probability that a couple matches all the characteristics is not one over 12 million, is one over 1 million. Um, don't ask me how this number was calculated. I can give you the references. I should have put them here. They are the same from the Monty Hall um, example. So someone calculated that the probability that one randomly selected couple will match all the characteristics is one over 1 million, not one over 12 million because product rule is not valid, but they went out there and then they evaluate these probabilities and they said one over 1 million. There's still something wrong with this case. Um, what else is wrong? So even if I tell you the probability that a randomly selected couple matches all the characteristics is one over 1 million, are you still confident that they are the guilty couple? Well, it turns out that this is not the probability that we want. Again, we are fooled by the match. We don't want the probability that, that a couple matches the, the characteristics. We want the probability that a couple is guilty given that they match the characteristics. So we have a couple that matches the characteristics, yes? And we want this couple to know whether they commit the, the robbery. We don't want just the couple that matches the characteristics. From the population, there will be many people matching these characteristics. So it's not just a matter of finding a match, it's a matter of finding the guilty party given that there is a match. So we are not, this is not the probability that we want. We want the probability of guilty given that they have matched the condition. So people have found again in the big city, there will be at least, at the very least, two or three couples that match. This, these characteristics, all of these characteristics. So um, it, with, there's no other evidence. And in fact, in this case, they had no other evidence except the fact that they match the characteristics. Um, then the, the guilty couple will be one of those two or one of those three. So the likelihood of being uh, the, the guilty couple is either one over two or one over three, depending on how many couples have satisfied the characteristics. So again, <clears throat> the probability, even if it's correctly calculated, someone give you this is the correct probability of a match, that is not the probability that we want, right? We want the probability that they are the guilty couple, given that we know that they match all of the conditions. <clears throat> That's a different probability. Okay, so things that we covered today, uh, how to combine probabilities with product rule, addition rule, how to update probabilities when we have new information available with conditional probabilities and Bayes' theorem. Uh, the key messages, like I said, first one that we said we talked in um, the very first slide, we want to pause when we're dealing with any probabilities because our God will be disconnected with the formulas. So we always want to pause. And first of all, we want to ask, where are the numbers coming from? Where are these probabilities coming from? They're probably coming from a sample. So we want to know which, sam which sample is giving me these numbers. Second question that we want to ask is, when we're calculating this probability, am I violating any assumptions? Assumptions of independence, assumptions that intersection cannot happen. Am I using the right probability? Um, you know, the prosecution fallacy. And also, is this really the probability that I want? So many times we will be given one probability and say, okay, this is the probability. But you, again, want to pause and think, is this the probability that I really want? Or is this just another correctly calculated probability, but it's not answering the question? Okay, so I want to conclude again by saying that all the slides and all the notes are in this page. You can get to them through the QR code. And I want to really um, encourage people to take a look at this book. I mean, uh, I read it and I found some of the examples. Actually, some of the examples that I talked about today are, are, are in this book. So it's really, really good book. And it talks about uh, randomness in general. So it's not just for forensics, but they show some examples in forensics. And for people that are more uh, mathematically oriented or, or programming, they, they like to use computer and program, there is an open book in forensic science in the programming language R. So you can get to it through this link 
and there are a lot of code, R code, for you to calculate your own uh, matching probabilities, profile probabilities. So um, it's another good resource that you can use. Thank you.